God could have chosen anywhere on earth, but he chose Israel. He could have revealed his redemption anywhere. He chose Jerusalem. The house of the Lord might have been any place on earth. He chose Mount Moriah. Past, present, and future, the mountain of the Lord has been a beacon of hope and remains a strategic site for the next temple of God. Dateline Jerusalem, the coming temple. Thank you so much for joining us. We are in the last program of this wonderful series, Dateline Jerusalem. Right, thank you for all that you've done. Okay, this is a interesting subject. What are we about to see right now? There's a lot of groups in Israel trying to raise temple awareness, sacrificial awareness, and you're about to witness an event that not many people have seen, the sacrifice of a goat done by actual Levites. Happens in Israel, let's go there right now. An event was recently held near the entrance to Jerusalem's Western Wall in which the Temple Institute and other Jewish organizations pulled their resources together in expressing the importance of the Temple. Moving forward to the Temple was written in large Hebrew letters so that no one could question the reason for the event. With a large graphic representation of the Temple behind them, priests demonstrated the procedures that took place in the Temple's past and what they anticipated in the coming Temple. They blew trumpets, said prayers, and even sprinkled blood on a makeshift altar. We asked one of the priests to explain further. In the army, we always have what's called Yavesh Lifneratu. We do dry runs before we use real bullets. And here, very soon, we are now in the redemption period, and uh, we're going to be soon going back, all of us Kohanim, priests, will be working again in the temple and uh, we are practicing all what we need to do in the temple so that we're ready very soon to do it for real. This is what the Kohanim wore, uh, exactly what they wore in the temple, except for uh, we need to be barefoot. In essence, we are, we are Shutafim, uh, partners with God, right? we will do anything for the love, for the object of our love, which is God, and God will do anything for the object of God's love, which is the Jewish people. Much like the bar mitzvahs, which also happened at a nearby Western Wall, there was reason to celebrate on this very special occasion. This event sent a clear signal to the world that a temple was forthcoming and preparations should be made for a long anticipated day of redemption. On our most recent trip to Israel, the Temple Mount Jerusalem Convention was happening. Voices from around the world speaking on the topic of a Jew's right to traditionally practice temple worship on the Temple Mount. We cut now to hear the varying perspectives that were displayed at this conference. Up first will be Duran Kaider, the Executive Director for Cry for Zion, the hosting organization for the convention. Duran is a Christian who has worked in the security sector in Israel for 15 years. Here now is Duran in Jerusalem. We started this uh, convention to bring together Jews and Christians to discuss the issue of the Temple Mount for the first time, I think, in roughly 2,000 years, um, where the opposite faiths come together about anything, really. And um, we personally saw an opportunity with the Temple Mount as a unifying factor. Um, it's a place where, in Christianity, uh, Jesus goes up with his disciples to Jerusalem and he points out the, and emphasizes how important Jerusalem is to him and, uh, and then his followers after him continued in those footsteps and that passion for Jerusalem and for the temple. That's where the, the uh, early church, if you will, that's where they would convene, that's where they would gather, that's where they would meet. It says daily actually. So if I want to aspire to see a temple built in Jerusalem, and the sacrificial system to be restored here in Jerusalem, and the Levitical uh, priesthood and so on, you know, worshiping up on the Temple Mount, and bringing my kids up to go worship in Jerusalem and literally go up to the temple, that is marred with the uh, fear of what about the Islamic Waqf? What about the international community, right? We have all these other strains on us that are basically saying, are you crazy? You're going to start World War III here, you know, this aspiration of yours. And then you find yourself in a small 
so-called radical group, right, that's been marginalized by the media. And so that's what we're trying to do here with this uh, convention. We're trying to bring uh, some really different voices, and you're going to see that in the lineup, if you noticed, of the speakers. We're having a very dynamic list of speakers and people that are not what you would think are all about the Temple Mount. And that's why I want you to recognize. It's not the settler community that's a bunch of radicals. It's not the Temple Mount faithful people that are a bunch of radicals. It's not what your media is going to label as a bunch of radicals that are about this movement. This is a movement that is growing in Eretz Yisrael, and it's growing daily. And the amount of Jews going up to visit the Temple Mount, even with all the Islamic threats, and with the terrorism, and with everything, we're going up. We're not shying away. This is another generation. Remember, just as Doran said, these individuals are offering different perspectives, even from your bearded hosts on television. It's important to note certain contentious subjects as West Bank settlers, that's territory that was given to the children of Abraham. Judea and Samaria is their rightful land. And we also support other organizations such as the Temple Mount Faithful. But we want to hear now from Yehuda Glick as he discusses the importance of Mount Moriah. Let's hear a Hineni. Hineni was the announcement that Abraham said when he came to the mountain of Moriah and said, here I am, Hashem, I'm ready to serve you. Use me for what you need me. Here I am. Hineni is the call that we have to say to Hashem, and Hashem, and Hashem could put us, put us everywhere, wherever we are. But we have to start. It can't be that Jerusalem Day is only celebrated here. It has to be an international Zion Day because God gave the presence not only to Israel. It's a house of prayer for all nations. And the mission, when Hashem chose the people of Israel, He said, you are to serve as a source of blessing to the families of the earth. So that's our concept. We're not here for ourselves. Hashem didn't pick us up for ourselves. He took us and He blessed us and He said, you'll be blessed for the nations. And now, just like the Zionist movement said, we have to take the destiny in our hands the same exact way. Without Jerusalem being restored, without God restoring uh, His own people, and like it says, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. In other words, before God fulfills all of his promises to Israel, we are never going to see the kingdom of God come. We're never going to see the uh, ultimate solution for the world. We have to um, fulfill our role in seeing the uh, fulfillment of God's purposes and destiny for Jerusalem. Never forget this. The Deliverer will come from Zion. It's not going to come from Rome. It's not going to come from Dallas or Moscow. The ultimate deliverance for mankind is going to come from Jerusalem, from Zion. So let's not try to redefine these things. Jerusalem is not the church. Jerusalem is Jerusalem. That's what part of what Paul is trying to say there in Romans 11, that don't be too, think you are too more important than you are. The deliverer will come from Zion. So here we read about this deliverance. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up, up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. We must have this ultimate vision for the world in our hearts of this salvation that is going to come, this deliverance that is going to come out from Zion, out from Jerusalem. And verse 3, many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, because it's going to be a house of prayer for all nations. <clears throat> and that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion, out of Zion, shall go forth the law or teaching and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
it's absolutely true that we can't take biblical places and prophecies and things and make them a metaphor to suit our own personal desires. Yerushalayim is Yerushalayim, and God's words will be fulfilled. And one of those prophecies is about the third temple. But it cannot be built until they have the ceremonial ashes of a red heifer, para aduma. And we've been covering that story from oh, the beginning. Oh, you turned to me when you talked about heifer? Hey. I'm sorry. Peter, take, take them down, babe. Oh, <laughs> only because they're still spotless. <laughs> I'll That's take the spotless, there you thank go. you. Good save. You were there when I they was. were in Dallas trying to... Get I took a selfie heifers. with the red heifer. I yeah. thought this was the prophetic moment to say, hey guys, I was here. Incredible. You know? <laughs> well, what we know is that their plan is for the next Passover. If they remain spotless, they will be sacrificed, which mm. will plunge us into the timeline of the third temple. Mm. Well. Unbelievable. I, I don't want to use the word plunge again, but we're going to go to or plunge ourselves right back into this prophetic conference. Let's go there now. For 2,000 years, the red heifers actually have been nowhere to be found haven't been heard of, no one's been speaking about them, uh, and until now. And I think we all have to realize what time we're living in, that this subject, and of course the subject of this whole convention, the subject of the, of the Third Temple, it's all coming back to life, it's all on the table, everybody's speaking about it, everybody's getting excited about it, and it's not just a sign, it's a, it's a big smack in the face that I think we all have to wake up, uh, just like Rabbi Huda Glick was saying, we, need all, we all need to wake up uh, uh, to understand this. So what is the importance of the red heifers? What's the process? Why is it so hard to find them? And what's the plan for the future? Uh, so first of all, the importance of the red heifers. It's a purification process. It's not a sacrifice or an offering. Uh, the red heifer is burned on a mound of wood um, which is mixed with uh, a few other things, a, a red uh, worm and hyssop branches. Um, and all of the ashes of the wood and the heifer is mixed with water and then sprinkled upon the people. And the people are ritually purified of uh, corpse impurity. There are certain levels of impurity um, according to uh, the Torah. And for corpse impurity, the only way to be purified is by using the ashes of the red heifer. We have some amazing stories about how we found the five red heifers that were found in in Texas. Um, just one quick story. Uh, the guys went out into the field uh, on one of the farms and they were searching and searching and they couldn't find a, a red heifer according to all the qualifications. And then they stopped under a tree uh, to pray. And they were praying and they finished praying. They went around the tree and they saw a mama red cow giving birth on the spot to a pure red heifer. And they said, everybody stop. Nobody move. Don't touch it. Don't, don't do anything. Don't tag it in the ear. And I think even the, the guy who was in charge of tagging, he was out because of COVID or something like that. They had a, it was just all miraculous, all these stories. When news broke of the airlift of kosher red heifers not long ago coming to Israel, I wrote that sadly a segment of the church will have knee jerk reactions to news of red heifers. That's because the lack of a temple is the last and desperate stand of replacement theology. The destruction of the temple was viewed by the later church as conclusive proof that the old covenant was dead and that it was superseded by something radically redefined. In fact, according to the New Testament, there is no conflict between the temple sacrifices and the gospel. None at all. Instead, they illustrate it. For Christians, sacrifices before Jesus pointed forward to Golgotha and afterward they point back to it. It's really that simple. Jesus has indeed, quote, offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, but that was never in conflict with the temple. Hebrews 10.4 clarifies that it was always impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins in order to save someone's eternal soul, but they do serve other important functions. The New Testament specifically mentions the ashes of the red heifer. It endorses their legitimacy in the present tense, of the author, and it states that the ashes certainly continued to remove ritual impurity of the physical body in Hebrews 9.13. It argues that this very truth should encourage our faith in Jesus. 
Thank you to Cry for Zion for allowing us to use the footage from this uh, temple conference. And guys, th these topics are polarizing for any Christians and Jews alike. Uh, just the topic of, of sacrifices and third temple. It, you know it's okay if you don't support the third temple. I know I don't personally because I want more time to bring the loss to Yeshua before the end times begins. So it's we're hearing differing perspectives, but they're unique and we need to know all sides of the aisle before we you know solidify this is where we stand. But the Word of God is most important where you need to stand. And we know Yeshua has already come. He is the last sacrifice, so that's good enough for me. But let's go back to this conference and hear from more voices and more interviews concerning the Third Temple. Next up, an interesting interview in which John Innerson, Christian host of the convention, speaks with Jewish news reporter Adam Berkowitz, who has studied Jewish law for seven years. Mr. Berkowitz responds now to a question about the recent interest regarding a coming temple. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what's going to be happening in the end of days in Christianity, in Judaism too, as well. And there's a lot of narshkite. Narshkite, it's a new word we need to, okay. to, to understand so, yeah, in Christianity. The, I've, okay. I've been, the, the more knowledgeable Christians, um, and even the more faithful ones, they are they are supporting, I, and I think it's coming from looking at what's happening and saying, hmm, what is this? You know, there's got to be a high level of intellectual honesty. If you come to Israel with open eyes, if you read the Old Testament with open eyes, you're going to find that it's not what you thought. And, and that's, that's, I think, an interesting experience for a lot of Christians. And, they, and those are the ones, I think, who support us. Also, I wanted to say, um, it's a new thing for Jews. So we're getting, I mean, and, and it's like we've been studying this for forever, you know, but there's also, and it's very connected to the land of Israel, there's also a lot of um, rejection by Orthodox Jews, um, especially Jews in America, but even Jews in Israel, who they're, you know, they're, they're like, oh, what do you want to do, bring back the temple? Well, I don't want to, but the Bible happens to talk about it an awful lot, so I don't really have a choice. Um, and they somehow managed to overlook that. If you are a Christian who believes in the Bible, then one of the premises of our faith should be we should look to Jesus and look to his disciples as our example of how we should live our faith, right? Well, guess what? Jesus had a passion for the temple and had a passion for the Temple Mount, and so did his disciples even after he left. Jesus himself, as we have said before at this convention, loved God's temple and called it the Father's house. He wept at the very thought of its desolation. And Paul had no problems bringing sin offerings in the temple in Acts chapter 21. And then he testified repeatedly on trial that he came to bring sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem and that he was purified by the ashes of the red heifer. And he committed no offense against the temple. This is from Acts 24 through 25. The evidence in Acts is clear and overwhelming. We know that in the end of the day, it's Hashem who does everything, but we are His soldiers. We are the ones who are supposed to take action and do whatever we can in order to bring the redemption closer. If it's regarding the Temple Mount, if it's regarding the Red Heifers, uh, which of course are connected because the whole purification process is to be able to go up to Beit HaMikdash and bring offerings and sacrifices and go up to the places where we cannot go up to because we're uh, ritually impure. God, I believe, is pushing our nation. He is pushing the narrative. He's the one that inspired our prophets. He's the one that restored us to our land, and he's the one who's gonna bring about his will in this land, period. Irregardless of who's the prime minister, who's the defense minister, etc. And I believe we're living in such a time as this, that this is what's happening, and if you're not a part of that narrative, you're going to freak out. And then we'll be able to say to Hashem, Hashem, we did not forget Zion. We did not forget Zion. We want now you arise and illuminate this world with your godly light from Zion. From your place, our king, appear and rule over us because we are waiting for you. When will you rule from Zion? Near in our near days, your name will be great and sanctified in the, your city, Jerusalem, because we are waiting for you. And we want to see it with our own eyes, your kingdom, as it was promised in the words of your prophets, in the words of your poet David, in the words of your Messiah, 
And we will say together, Hashem shall rule over the world forever and ever, the God of Zion. And at that day, He will be one, and His name will be one, and we together will all be united around the one and only one. Chag Sameach. I don't know about Kirsten, but I've thought that the third temple is a good thing. But I think yeah. you can correct us or me on that, yes? Well, there are two temples to come, guys. The wow. third temple is actually the tribulation temple. The fourth temple is the millennial temple that Messiah will rule and reign from. And here's the problem. Zechariah 6, 12 to 13 says that the Messiah will build the temple and rule and reign from there. So the Jews of now are waiting for who's going to build that next temple, and he will be the Messiah to them. But we know, according to prophecy, it's not going to be Yeshua that builds that next temple. It's going to be a false prophet. That's pretty crazy. Well, Mark Hitchcock, you got a chance to sit down with him, mm -hmm. an amazing teacher on prophecy. Tell us about that. Well, he's been in this whole series. We're, we're promoting his book, The End, and I got to sit down with him for one final discussion on prophecy. Yeah, no, the, we live in the time right now of the church age. Yeah. And uh, my view is, like in Matthew 24, you see these birth pains that are mentioned yeah. that are really in the tribulation period. Okay. What, I, what I like to say now um, is we're, we're, we're seeing Braxton Hicks contractions. Interesting. Now, these like are that. kind of the premature labor pains yeah. that are kind of leading to what's ultimately going to come during that time of tribulation. Mm -hmm. But the event that really sets all of the end times into motion is going to be the rapture of the church. Mm -hmm. When that event takes place, you know, it's going to be the greatest event in human history, really yeah. since the flood. You just think about, you know, millions of people, maybe billions of people, you know, so. they're gone. They've vanished in, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The, mm. the, the rapture is going to be a, an, an earth-shaking, earth-shattering event uh, that I think probably, too, will be the greatest evangelistic tool in human history. I agree. people everywhere disappear. So yeah. it, it's really the key to all these events that follow in, in the end times. So why is it important for people to study Bible prophecy? Why is it necessary for us to follow those words in the Bible? Some people think it doesn't have to do with me. If I'm going to be gone, what does it matter? Well, Bible prophecy has a lot of practical application for our lives. It mm. has a purifying effect. Yeah. If we really believe that Jesus can come at any moment, it's going to change how we live. That's right. It also, Bible prophecy, gives us confidence because we know that since the Bible has predicted hundreds of things that have come to pass, yeah. we know that the things it predicts for the future will come to pass, and we can know what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Uh, not because we know it, but because God has predicted these things. So it gives a comfort to our lives and a confidence. Uh, to, to live a life that's pleasing to God. Everybody wants to know what's happening next, but God gave us the end to our story. Mm -hmm. And it's a good end, but we still need to be prepared. And, and I believe in Revelation, it says, blessed are those who study the words of this book. Mm -hmm. There's a blessing imparted to us if we do that as well. And that's right. It's the only blessing. It's, it's the only book with that kind of blessing. That's it's, right. it's called, we often call it the blessing book. Yeah. Of the book of Revelation. Yeah, the one who reads it, the one who hears, the one who does the things commanded in this book is going to be blessed. I believe it's a good witnessing tool especially to the Jewish people, because so specifically, even in Matthew 24, Yeshua was telling the Jewish people, this is what happens to you. We don't read, this is what happens to America, and mm -hmm. this is what happens to Israel. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the strongest witness. Hey, my brethren, you want to know what happens to your future? Mm -hmm. It's written in the book. That's right, and that's why we have to take these prophecies literally. Yes. Because the Jewish people, there, there's a lot of prophecies that have been given to Israel that have been literally fulfilled. Yeah. Now, if we take these prophecies in the future and that we say, well, those aren't going to be literally fulfilled, we have no basis to really witness to exactly, a Jewish person. Yeah. But we tell them, look, these, all these prophecies have been literally fulfilled in your history and your past. Mm -hmm. You know, there are about a thousand prophecies in the Bible. I, I talk about that here in the book, The yeah, End. I read that. Yeah. And, but about 500 have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Bible has quite a track record. Perfect. An, an unbelievable track record. That's a thousand. Yeah. We have all these unfulfilled prophecies. And you're right, many of them have to do with Israel, with the Jewish people and their future. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great evangelistic tool for them. But uh, for, for Gentiles as well, people want yeah. hope in our world today. They want to know that uh, there's going to be a better world. And we can tell them with full confidence in the Bible, the best is yet to come. That's right. And uh, it may not be in this life, but it will be certainly in the life to come. I agree. What would you say to believers in Messiah now? Uh, what should we be doing uh, in knowledge of Bible prophecy, the events, the turmoil we see in the world? What should we be doing as believers in Messiah to prepare? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think a lot of things. One, I kind of mentioned earlier, live a pure life, you mm -hmm. know, live a godly life, be serving, you know, be, be finding a place of service to live for the Lord, be 
have a sense of urgency about sharing the gospel with people. Yeah. We don't know when the end's going to come. You know, it's sad. A lot of us kind of live like like universalists. Yeah, we kind of true. almost live as if everybody's just going to be okay and be saved. Yeah, we don't true. believe that, yeah. but we kind of practically live that way sometimes. We need to, to live as if we really believe there is a real heaven, there is a real hell, mm -hmm. uh, that there's salvation only through Jesus Christ. And so we need to live with that, with that sense of urgency. Uh, we need to be generous with our resources. Uh, obviously, if, if Jesus can come at any moment, uh, we want to be uh, have our money out there in circulation, yeah. and and not just hoard it all. Now, obviously, we save and we're we're, yeah. we're wise with money, but there's a, it really affects every area of life. It does. So prophecy is not you know one person used to say it's kind of you know pie in the sky you know kind of sweet yeah. by and by kind of stuff. And a lot of uh, pastors today won't don't talk about it because they say I want to talk to people about here and now. Kind of yeah. how to live your life now. We don't want to, to get into that, but all the passages, the main passages in the New Testament related to prophecy, all have practical application related right. to them. So there's nothing more practical than Bible prophecy for daily living. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure speaking with you for this entire series. And we are giving this book, The End, to those who give a donation to the ministry. It'll help you. It's an amazing resource. We have this bookmark that Josh and I came up with with amazing scriptures about the end and prophecy. It'll encourage you and it will bless you. I know that you're probably wondering, why do we repeat ourselves so many times? I'm sure the disciples asked Jesus the very same question. This is a very important topic because we know through biblical prophecy that after the third temple, two thirds during the tribulation of the Jewish people are going to perish. If you already know Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, you do because somebody sought you out with the good news of what he did. And now it's your responsibility to go and share that news with others. If you don't know him, Yeshua came, lived a perfect life, fulfilling all of the law and the prophets. He died blameless to take on your sin. And he rose after three days, taking the, the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He's up there with the Father waiting for you, and today is the day that you accept His free gift of salvation by simply giving Him your sins and making Him your Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 We would like to personally thank Dr. Sy for all of his teaching throughout this whole series. We thank all of you that have made this series possible. We have so many more to come. Your donations make it possible. So in Hebrew, toda, toda raba. Thank you very much for everything you've done. And also thank you to you guys for all you've done in this series. It's been amazing. Yeah. It's time to go. It is time to go, as we always say, Sha'alu Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our resource this week, The End, written by Mark Hitchcock. This 500-page hardcover book is made available to you for your generous donation to Zola Levitt Ministries. The accompanying bookmark by Joshua and Caleb provides important scripture from God's Word concerning the end. Please remember, we depend on your generous gifts, which allow us to bring timely updates regarding Bible prophecy and the end of days. Thank you so much for your continuous support of this ministry. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information, broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.